A few years ago, I put out a video on everything that you needed to know to open up a Roth IRA at Charles Schwab. And you guys really liked it because it's still the number one video when you search this topic. But I've received some comments lately that Charles Schwab has updated their UI and my step-by-step -step instructions are no longer totally accurate. So this video is a completely redone and updated version for 2024. Getting started investing can be really daunting if you've never done it before, but I promise by the end of this video, you will be 100% confident opening up one of the easiest tax advantaged investment accounts at one of the most reputable brokerages in the industry, even if you're a total beginner. So what is a Roth IRA and what makes it so accessible for the beginner investor? IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. Well, technically the IRS calls them Individual Retirement Arrangements, but the misnomer is much more popular and widely understood for some reason. While IRAs and 401ks function very similarly, they are both tax advantaged retirement accounts, a 401k is completely tied to your employer. IRAs on the other hand have absolutely nothing to do with your employer. It's in the name, individual. You can open up and contribute to these accounts regardless of your employment status. You just need to be earning some type of income. You could be self-employed. You could have a part-time job that doesn't offer traditional retirement benefits. You could, of course, be a normal W-2 employee who has access to a 401k through their work. You could even be a stay-at-home parent with no income of your own as long as your spouse earns an income and you file taxes jointly. You don't even need to be an adult. Minors with earned income, say from a part-time job in high school, can open up and contribute to an IRA. IRAs come in two different types, which you choose when you set up the account for the first time, traditional or Roth. Both traditional and Roth IRAs offer tax advantage benefits, but they differ in the way in which they provide those benefits. Traditional IRAs offer the tax benefits upfront, meaning at the time of contribution. When you contribute to a traditional IRA and then go to file your taxes for that year, your contributions to that traditional IRA directly reduce your taxable income for that year. So let's say you earn $50,000 a year and you contributed $3,000 to your traditional IRA. When you go to file taxes, the IRS will calculate your taxable income to be 50,000 minus 3,000, so 47,000. All things being equal and assuming that you withhold the normal amount from your paycheck, that means you'll likely see a refund for the income taxes paid on that $3,000. And since it's a retirement account, you'll likely keep the money in there for a long time. You'll invest it, it'll hopefully grow, and then when you go to make a withdrawal to use during retirement, you'll pay ordinary income tax on the amount that you withdraw. A Roth IRA functions in the exact opposite way. No tax benefits when you contribute, but complete tax benefits when you go to withdraw that money during retirement. So if you contribute $3,000 to a Roth IRA, you won't see any additional tax benefits for that year like you would for a traditional IRA. The IRS, for example, won't reduce your taxable income and you probably won't receive a bigger refund. But that money then can grow over time, and when you go to make that withdrawal during retirement, the entire amount will be tax-free. $3,000, assuming a standard return rate of 7%, would grow to about $23,000 over a period of 30 years. So that's a lot of money that you save taxes on. Just a little side tip to make you sound like a real investor. A lot of beginners shorten Roth IRA to just Roth, like I'm contributing to my Roth. This doesn't really make any sense because many other investment accounts like 401ks can be structured as either traditional or Roth. It'd be like shortening I'm driving in my purple car to just I'm driving in my purple. It doesn't really make any sense. But the sentence I'm driving in my car still has meaning even though it's less specific. Think of the words Roth and traditional as adjectives that describe the IRA in greater detail. Okay, so IRAs are great investment accounts that come with some pretty serious tax benefits, especially Roth IRAs, which let you grow your money completely tax-free. So what's the catch? The IRS wants people to save for their retirement, which is why these accounts are tax advantaged. But the IRS also wants to incentivize people to keep the money that they've contributed in the accounts reserved for retirement and not withdraw it at any time to use for something else. They do this by enacting a 10% penalty on all withdrawals made out of IRAs before the age of 59 and a half. But there's a big asterisk here for Roth IRAs specifically. Not traditional IRAs, not 401ks, not anything else. But for Roth IRAs, the IRS allows you to withdraw your contributions, not the gains, but just your original contributions from Roth IRAs at any time, at any age, without any penalty or tax. 
And while you should do your best to keep the money that you've contributed to your Roth IRA in your Roth IRA reserved for retirement, because the longer it sits there untouched, the longer it has to grow, this should help you feel more confident in contributing to your Roth IRA because you know that the money that you've contributed in can be withdrawn at any time without any penalty or tax. I think of my Roth IRA as my backup emergency fund. I keep a cash-based emergency fund, which you should too if you can, but I sleep better at night knowing that I can pull from my Roth IRA in a true emergency. The other big limitation of IRAs, whether Roth or traditional, is that there is a maximum amount of money that you can contribute to them in each year. As of 2024, that limit is $7,000 or $8,000 if you're over the age of 50. If you earn less than the maximum amount, say you have a part-time job working one day on the weekends and you only made $5,000 for the entire year, your maximum amount that you can contribute to an IRA is capped at your total income. If you're married, since IRAs are individual, each spouse can have their own IRA. And if one spouse doesn't work, as long as the other spouse earns at least $14,000 a year and you file your taxes jointly, each spouse can contribute $7,000 to their own IRAs. And it's worth noting that you have until tax day to make contributions for the previous year. So if you're watching this in March, 2024, you have until April 15th, 2024 to make contributions for the 2023 tax year. The final limitation is that you can only contribute to a Roth IRA if your income is under a certain amount. Luckily, this amount is pretty high and shouldn't limit most Americans, but as of 2024, if your income is above $161,000 for single tax filers or $240,000 for married filed jointly, you can't directly contribute to a Roth IRA. I say directly because there are ways to get around this by contributing to a traditional IRA and then immediately converting it to a Roth IRA, which essentially gives you the same result but in a few extra steps. Google backdoor Roth IRA if you want to learn more. You might also be wondering, if you open a Roth IRA today, how much could you reasonably expect to have by retirement? Well, obviously the answer to that heavily depends on your age, how close to retirement you are, how much you can afford to contribute each year, and how the stock market performs between now and your retirement date. But let's say you're only 25 years old, putting you 40 years away from a standard retirement age of 65. If you contribute $7,000 to a Roth IRA, which is the current annual max, every single year for 40 years, assuming a 7% return rate, you would have about $1.5 million saved for retirement. And the best part, every single penny of that $1.5 million would be completely tax-free. And if you have a spouse that does the same thing, that amount would double to $3 million. I'll leave a link to the investment calculator that I use in the description below if you want to play around with your own numbers and time frame. Okay, so we've covered why Roth IRAs are fantastic tax advantage accounts that are accessible to almost everyone. What comes next? How do you actually open, contribute to, and invest in a Roth IRA? Luckily, it's super easy. The whole process can be done in less than 15 minutes. Let's break it down into a few easy steps. First, choosing your brokerage. A brokerage is simply the firm that holds and facilitates the management of your Roth IRA. There are so many brokerages out there, but the biggest names in the game are Fidelity, Vanguard, and Charles Schwab. I've used all three of these brokerages for different things, and their offerings are pretty much identical, especially for simpler accounts like Roth IRAs. No setup fees, no administrative fees, no trading commissions when you invest in things like ETFs, index funds, mutual funds, and individual stocks, nothing. That said, Charles Schwab has a really great, relatively simple UI, which is why I recommend it to most beginners. First, navigate to the Roth IRA page on Schwab's website. I'll leave the link in the description and start by hitting the button, open a Roth IRA. Make sure you have your social security number or your tax identification number handy and click get started. It'll ask you for some basic personal information. Make sure you double check that you entered in your social security number correctly and then hit continue. On the next page, it'll send a code to either your cell phone or your email, enter in the code and then hit continue. Create a unique login and password. This is a good PSA to remind you never to use the same password for multiple sites because if one site gets hacked, all of your sites are at risk and you really don't want that to happen with investment accounts. Consider using a password manager if you wanna stay really secure and ensure that you don't ever reuse the same password. The next page asks for your home address and citizenship information. If you want to add a trusted contact, so somebody that Schwab can talk to on behalf of your account, like your spouse, for example, you can add their information here. It's always good practice to add beneficiaries for your financial accounts. You just need their name, birth date, and social security number if you know it. 
You can add multiple beneficiaries here and declare the percentage split that they should receive should you pass away. Next, it'll ask for your employment information. This is just for regulatory reasons. Remember, you don't actually need to even be employed to open up and contribute to a Roth IRA as long as you or your spouse have earned income. The next page has a couple questions that all brokerages need to ask. If these apply to you, you should know. You can then elect to receive paperless documents. If you really want to get paper versions of everything in the mail, make sure you uncheck these boxes. Schwab then asks if you want to enable special features like margin and options trading. For the beginner investor, you definitely don't need or even want these features enabled. These are features geared towards day traders and retirement accounts should follow a more long-term investing strategy. Finally, review all the provided information to make sure it's correct. Read through the terms and conditions on the following page and then hit continue and that's it, you're done. So if step one was opening a Roth IRA, step two is making your first contribution. Schwab may prompt you to do this right after opening your account, but you can also do it at any time by navigating to the Move Money tab and then selecting Transfers and Payments. You have a few different options here. Most people will probably find the Online Transfers option to be the easiest. This will allow you to transfer money from whatever banking institution that you use. If you don't already have a bank account linked, you can select Link or Delete External Account and follow the steps. If you're transferring from a normal bank account and not an investment account, make sure that the cash option is selected. And then under from, select your bank, and under to, select the Schwab Roth IRA. The balance shown for your Roth IRA reflects how much non-invested cash you have available in that account, not the total balance. Of course, if this is your first contribution, that balance will read $0 regardless. Underneath, a section will appear asking you to choose which year you want to contribute money to. If you're contributing between January 1st and April 15th, you'll be presented with two options, either the current year or the previous year. Otherwise, it'll just be the current year. It'll also tell you how much money you've already contributed to for that year so that you don't accidentally over-contribute. In fact, Schwab should stop you, although I've never actually tested this myself. Then input how much you want to contribute and how frequently you want to make that contribution. For example, if your goal is to max out your Roth IRA and you're starting in January, a good way to do that would be by making a monthly contribution of $583 over 12 months. On the next page, review your transfer and then hit submit. Now on to the last step, and this is a really important one because I've met a lot of people who contribute to a Roth IRA and then stop because they think that's all they need to do. When you transfer money from your bank account to your Roth IRA, it gets transferred as cash. In other words, it's not invested. If you navigate to the Positions tab and see a detailed view of your Roth IRA, you should see a line called Cash and Cash Investments. By default, all of the money transferred into your Roth IRA will be put in this bucket. This money is just like money sitting in your bank account. It is not invested and therefore it does not have the chance to grow. Of course, that also means that it does not have the opportunity to decrease in value, which is always a risk that you take when you invest in the stock market. But that risk is relatively low, especially when you're investing for the long term like you would for a retirement. And there are ways to mitigate this risk as you get closer to retirement by investing in things like bonds and less so in stocks but that's a totally another topic entirely. The really important takeaway here is that after contributing to your Roth IRA, you have to take that extra step and invest that money so that it has the opportunity to grow over time. So how do you do that? Luckily, Schwab makes it really easy. And you likely don't even need to wait until Schwab officially clears your transfer from your bank account. With some exceptions, Schwab lets you invest the money that you transfer immediately. Simply go to the Trade tab and then select All-in-One Trade Ticket. You could go down a whole rabbit hole trying to choose what to invest in. Schwab offers everything from individual stocks, mutual funds, index funds, ETFs, but I'm going to keep it simple and follow the three fund portfolio strategy. This strategy invests in just three things, one US-based index fund or ETF, one international index fund or ETF, and one bond fund. This approach is the simplest way your investments can represent nearly the entire stock market, meaning that you're less susceptible to individual fluctuations from industry changes or individual companies, and your growth is more likely to be stable over time. I have a whole video going into way more detail on the three fund portfolio approach, which I'll link above and in the description below. If you want to follow the three fund portfolio strategy, one good option for the US based fund offered by Schwab is something called the Schwab US Broad Market ETF. Its ticker symbol is SCHB, 
type in the ticker symbol, and then hit enter on your keyboard. The page will refresh with some specific stats on this fund. There's a ton of info here, but don't feel overwhelmed. There's only really two numbers you need to look at here. The available cash and cash investments at the top, which tells you how much money you have available to invest, and the current market price, which is listed just below the fund name. Under the action dropdown, select buy. Then in the quantity, select the number of shares that you want to purchase. This will be limited by the amount of cash that you have available and the current market price of one share. And if you're following the three fund portfolio approach, make sure that you leave enough cash left over so that you can invest in one or two other funds as well. It's also worth noting that you cannot buy fractions of a share. Only whole number quantities are available. So unless you get really lucky, you'll likely have a small amount of cash left over. Schwab does offer what they call Schwab stock slices, where you can buy fractions of S&P 500 individual stocks for just $5. But I tend to prefer fund-based approach for my retirement accounts, like index funds and ETFs. If there's interest, however, let me know in the comments below, and I can do a video on fractional investing with Charles Schwab. There is a small exception here, however, and that's with this little button here called reinvest dividends. Dividends are small amounts of monies paid by the companies composed of that fund out of their monthly or quarterly profits. When reinvest dividends is selected, those dividends will immediately be used to reinvest into that same fund, even if those dividends are not enough to cover the price of one full share. I generally recommend keeping the selection on to reinvest dividends because you usually want to have your money invested as much as possible in your Roth IRA and not just sitting as unused cash. The next selection that you need to make is that transactions order type. There are a few options here. A limit order will let you set a maximum share price before the transaction is deployed based on the timing that you select. A market order is the simplest option. It simply executes the transaction at the current market price or as close to current market price as it can get. If you're purchasing outside of stock market hours, so 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday, excluding holidays, there might be a little bit more fluctuation in the price that you actually pay when the stock market next opens versus the current market price, which is why the estimated amount that you see here might be a little bit different than what's listed above. But when trading really popular index funds or ETFs that broadly cover most of the US market, this fluctuation is pretty insignificant, like pennies on the share. This difference is not enough for me to worry about, so I personally choose market orders for their simplicity most of the time. I have a whole video going into detail about the different order types and when it might be advantageous to use one order type over the other, which I'll link in the description and above if you wanna check it out. All right, so before reviewing the order, if you wanna add another fund or stock to the transaction, say for example, you're following the three fund portfolio approach and you've already added the US-based fund and now you wanna add your international fund, you can do that by hitting add order at the bottom and following the same steps. Then hit review order, make sure all the details look good and hit place order. If you're placing the order outside of stock market hours, it will process as soon as the stock market next opens. At any time, if you wanna see how your Roth IRA is doing and how your money is invested, you can hit your Roth IRA on the summary page or navigate to the positions tab. Here you'll see a breakdown of all the individual stocks or funds that you currently invest in, the number of shares that you own, the current market price of those shares, and the total value that they represent in your Roth IRA. And that's it. If this is your first time investing in the stock market, make sure to check back in a couple days just to ensure that the whole transaction went ahead smoothly. Note that if you set up recurring transactions from your bank account, you'll still need to go in every time that transaction hits Schwab to actually invest that money. Schwab won't automatically invest it for you unless you set up their automatic investing feature, which is only available for select mutual funds. If that sounds like something that you wanna do, check out my other video on how to set up automatic investing at Charles Schwab, which I'll link above and in the description. If you learned something from this video, please consider giving it a like and dropping a comment below. Consider subscribing if you want to see more helpful investing and personal finance content just like this. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.